Lot. Lot. Right. Pastor, because let me know if you see it on Facebook. I accidentally ended the meeting, so I had to start over again. <laughs> oh, Lord. I'm glad y'all still there, though. We didn't, again, we yeah, didn't hang up on how. you. Uh, I don't you know see, how. Do you see it live on Facebook? Yeah. Okay. All right. So let me do this one last piece. Joe, I need you to show me how to go live on Facebook. Okay. Because I, I may take. All right. So, uh, Minister Echoes, it's all yours. I'm going to stop my screen share. Well, I'm not sharing anymore. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you know it is me? all you. All right. Thank you so much. All right, everyone. As you said, I'm Minister Vasha Eccles from um, Kingdom Praise Ministries, and I'll be your um, instructor today. Um, before we get started, y'all know I got to have my little conference call with Jesus, so give me a second. I love you, Lord, and I live. My voice to worship you, oh my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King. In what you hear, and let it be a sweet, sweet sounds in your ear. Lord, I ask that you decrease me and increase you. I ask that you allow this word to fall on fertile soil. Allow people to learn as much as I have learned just from studying in this word, I leave it all in your hands. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. Okay, so today's lesson is the final lesson um, of the unit Liberating Letters. The title of this lesson is Fruit of Freedom. Our devotional and background scriptures are from Galatians chapter five, verses 16 through 26. Just what does it mean to live holy lives in the spirit? Holiness is often equated with purity, but it also can be defined as set apart. God wants us to be holy, literally set apart unto him. In other words, our words, our actions, and our attitudes should be the same as those who have not been redeemed. This is because we have been called to holy living or living set apart unto the Lord. Some Christians falsely assume that they can please God and the flesh at the same time. In this week's lesson, the Apostle Paul reminded the Galatian readers that the flesh-generated life and the spirit-empowered life are incompatible. He pointed out that there is a major difference between living in the flesh and living in Holy Spirit. Just a little background. After defending his apostleship in Galatians chapter one and two, and the doctrine of justification by faith in Galatians chapters three and four, Paul set out to define, to defend Christian freedom in daily living in Galatians chapters five and six. His argument was that life regulated by the inner control of the Holy Spirit produces the godly behavior that the law could never produce. Paul affirmed that believers still struggle with sin and don't always do what we should, even though we just desire to honor Christ. The flesh and the spirit 
are at war with one another and our minds and bodies are the battlefield. In Galatians chapter five, Paul told his readers that because Christ made us free, we have been freed from the law. So stand strong in the freedom. Don't go back into slavery to the law again. He used circumcision to support his position in Galatians chapter five, verses one through six. Paul has received word that the Galatian believers were trying to get right with God by keeping the law. So in verses seven through 10, he questioned who caused them to stop following the truth that salvation is by faith alone. But he also exhorted them saying that he trusted that the Lord, that, that he trusted the Lord to make sure that they wouldn't believe those false ideas. Then in verses 13 and 15, 13 through 15, Paul said that he was glad that the Lord chose the Galatians to be free. Also while warning them not to use their freedom as an excuse to please themselves. This would cause them to miss what real love was all about. Loving your neighbor the same as you love yourself. The attempt of the Galatian believers to attain spiritual perfection by keeping the law, it ended in failure. Their churches were torn apart by conflict. There were biting and devouring of each other. And Paul warned them against this in verse 15. And our lesson starts at verse 16. Verse 16 reads, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. As I mentioned earlier, members of the Galatian churches were torn apart by conflict. They needed to be reminded of how they could be empowered to really love each other. Paul's answer was to submit to the Holy Spirit. Since the Christian life begins with the Holy Spirit, the only way to continue the Christian life is by the power of the Holy Spirit. We cannot do it without him. The Holy Spirit is not only the source of Christian life, but he is also the only power that can sustain Christian life. Actually, the phrase walk by spirit indicates submission to his leading. The command to walk in a certain way refers to choosing a particular way of life or lifestyle. But we must realize that Paul has in mind, what Paul has in mind is more than a matter of outward lifestyle. He is speaking of a way of life in which all aspects of life are directed and transformed by the Holy Spirit. Paul then concluded that if the Galatian believers walk by spirit, they will not gratify the desires of the flesh. In other words, if we live by the spirit, we won't satisfy the desires of our sinful nature. Verse 17, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. Paul was saying here that the flesh or sinful nature of this and the spirit are in direct opposition to each other and continually in conflict or at war. So that we as believers don't always do what is good, don't always do the good things we want to do. This inner spiritual warfare is the experience of all those who live by the spirit. The conflict Paul is describing here is not the moral conflict that everyone feels at some time, nor the conflict of a wayward Christian who is no longer committed to Christ. He is speaking about the conflict of a thoroughly committed Christian who is choosing each day to walk by the Spirit. 
each day, the Christian who chooses to walk by the spirit is involved in a fierce battle between the Holy Spirit and the sinful nature. It is necessary to emphasize that this point because many Christians are ashamed to admit that they are experiencing this conflict. They seem to think that somehow mature Christians should be above this kind of struggle. For some reason, they imagine that the great saints were too spiritual to feel the desires of the flesh. But Paul contradicts such ideas about super spirituality. They don't exist. But while Paul honestly speaks about the reality of continuous moral warfare in the life of a spirit-led Christian, he is not painting a picture of defeat. Anyone who has sworn their allegiance to the Holy Spirit is in this war between the spirit and their sinful nature will not use their freedom to indulge the desires of the flesh. Neither will they fulfill the desires of the flesh. Paul declared that the results of this fierce conflict between the Holy Spirit and the flesh is what is that we will not do what we want to do, but instead we will do what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. Verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. After declaring that there is a constant spiritual conflict between our flesh and the indwelling Holy Spirit in every believer, Paul tells the Galatian readers that they can have spiritual victory at any given moment by just surrendering to the will of the Holy Spirit daily in order to bring the flesh under his control. The word led is in the present tense and suggests a continuous leading. Paul was not thinking about a one-time spiritual experience. Instead, he was speaking of the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, which is also known as sanctification. Since Jesus Christ has set us free from the bondage of the law, Paul declared, you are not under the law. The fact that Paul mentioned the law is noteworthy. The law could identify sin, but it could never deliver anyone from the power of sin or its consequences. The spirit of God, not the Mosaic law, should control the saint of God. The law cannot give life or power. It only demands obedience and condemns disobedience. But the Holy Spirit provides what the law cannot. Verse 19, the acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. This list that Paul gives is not exhaustive meaning that it does not include every evil work of the flesh, but they are representative of all works of the flesh. Other sins can be added, but what is listed illustrates the flesh, what the flesh produces without God. In fact, this list sounds very familiar. It's a lot of things that are going on today. The sins of the flesh listed in the verse are sexual in nature. Indulgent and self-gratifying sexual acts with another person outside of a marriage relationship make up sexual immorality. Impurity results from improper sexual acts. The term that was also used in conjunction with purity codes of the, most, of the law of Moses. God desires that his people acknowledge the holiness of their bodies and act accordingly. Extravagant sexual vice, uncontrolled and shameless is debauchery. The term implies the lack of self-control, even to the point of shocking others without regard of decency. Verse 20, 
idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions. Idolatry involves replacing worship of the one true God in exchange for a lie. We don't need to think of idolatry as a strict term of acts of worship to a physical image. Idolatry can be considered as whatever diverts people's attention, efforts, and resources away from the desires of God. Witchcraft is the attempt to use physical objects and rituals to manipulate the spiritual world. Examples would include ancient pagan practices of magic, incantations, and drug use. Hatred refers to a spirit of hostility toward another person. Discord is a general description for the feelings of hostility among people, quarreling or disharmony. Feelings of jealousy speak to the strong feelings that may arise from seeing the success of another person. Fits of rage, a strong burst of anger stemming from an impetu impetuous mindset. Self-ambition results when hostile groups advance their own interests. These kinds of acts are the opposite of the self-giving love initiated by God's spirit. Dissensions continue interpersonal strife to the point of causing division and factions point to false beliefs that lead to destruction, that lead to destructive differences within the community. Verse 21, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. The semicolon after the word envy indicates that it goes with the previous group of self behavior, of selfish behavior. It refers to the desire to deprive others of what they have. Paul ends this list of vices by describing two public displays of overindulgence and self destruction drunkenness intoxication from alcohol, harms the body and clouds the person's judgment. A drunken person might lose control of his or her better judgment and participate in orgies. These are public displays of indulgence, gluttony, and immorality. The underlying Greek text reflects the name of the mythical god, Comus, the god of festivities. The Roman festival, Bacchnalia was observed in honor of the gods and celebrated through rampant drunkenness and sexual immorality. That vice list concludes with and like and the like. Confirms that Paul had not compiled a comprehensive list, rather, he wanted to highlight the specific words of the flesh applicable to the Galatians. When Paul says, I warn you as I did before, this indicates that he, that this was not the first time that he taught the Galatians concerning these topics. To those people who live like this, the list, the listed vices of the flesh, a strong warning is evident. People gain their eternal inheritance of life through faith not ethical behavior, but right behavior serves as an indication of the presence of, the, of God's spirit. People who fail to act in accordance with the spirit will not inherit the kingdom of God. Occasional failure to live in this regard was not Paul's concern. Instead, he was concerned with who mock God's spirit as they continually live in the flesh. Persistent disregard for the spirit indicates that transforming faith is not present. A life led by the spirit will not continue to will not continue the status quo of living apart from God's path.
verse 22. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. The word but indicates that Paul was about to present a contrast between what is produced by living in the flesh and what is produced by living in the spirit. Whereas the flesh produces works, the Holy Spirit produces fruit. There are two things we notice about the contrast between works and fruit. First, since the word fruit often refers to something wholesome and worthwhile, the fruit here is not works, but virtues that produce good works or deeds. Second, whereas the word works is plural, fruit is singular. This suggests that one fruit produced by the Holy Spirit in each believer consists of nine characteristics, as we shall see in the remaining part of this verse and in verse 23. The fruit of the Spirit is unified in purpose because God produces all of its virtues or characteristics. Paul now begins to list the characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit. Love is the first virtue of the fruit of the Spirit that Paul listed. It is the greatest of all spiritual gifts. Love is the chief identifying mark of Christians. It also it's also the foundation of the fruit of the spirit. The Greek word for love here is agape. That's my middle name, y'all. And it means self-sacrificing love, like Jesus Christ demonstrated in John 3, 16. This is the kind of love that extends even to unworthy sinners and displays itself in outward relationships. And it does not change with our circumstances. Joy is the second characteristic of the fruit of the spirit, and it comes from within and should not be confused with happiness, which usually depends on our circumstances. But we can experience joy even when we are suffering. Peace is the result of the believer's reconciliation with God. It is an inner calm cause by peace with God. It's not just the absence of strife as when a war ends. It's the inner peace. This inner peace comes from Christ, from Jesus Christ, spirit. Like joy, inner peace that comes from God does not change with circumstances. Forbearance expresses patient treatment of others. Even in, the, even in response of wrongful treatment. Kindness speaks of a person's loving disposition towards others. People can show this temperament because God's actions towards humanity provide the ultimate example. Goodness is the attribute that marks the collective people of God. The concept might imply a willingness to do good for others by acts of radical generosity. Such fruit addressed the difficult work of building right relationships among believers and establishing appropriate witness to unbelievers. Paul's teaching emphasizes that work because of the factions that had formed among the churches of Galatia. Therefore, formation by the Holy Spirit was required for Galatians to become one in Christ. Verse 23, gentleness and self-control again against such things, there is no law. While the previous grouping of fruit focused on a person's treatment of others, the final grouping concerns a person's demeanor. Gentleness implies self-restraint, even in the midst of a disagreement. Paul would encourage the Galatians to put this fruit into practice as they work to restore their community. When the fruit of self-control is present in a believer's life, desires and passions do not rule that person. Verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus 
have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Christians are not to be passive while bearing this, the spirit's fruit. While the spirit has a role in the growth of the fruit, the Christian must end anything that might hinder the growth conditions of the fruit. This requires that Christians put to death selfish desires. Paul's imagery unites Jesus' followers with the experience on the cross. Following Jesus and expressing faith in him requires believers to have crucified the desires and the ways of the flesh. The language reminds believers to put to death sinful practices so that new life might be found. Paul wanted the Galatians to live not for themselves, but for the one who died for them. As we live in the, in the spirit, we avoid all sinful tendencies, including the passions and sinful desires, which war against the soul. Verse 25. Since we live by the spirit, let us keep in step the spirit. Considering Paul's similar imperative in Galatians chapter five, verse 16, the statement serves as the bookend to the section of the letter. By including himself in the subject using we and us, Paul identified with the situation of the Galatians. What he asked of them applied to himself as well. To live by the spirit necessitates a resulting walk with the spirit. Following the spirit's lead brings a life of righteousness, demonstrating the transformational fruit of the spirit. Verse 26, let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Paul's concern for the Galatian unity is evident. If they live by the flesh, the spirit's fruit would be absent and divisions would deepen. The conceited glory sought by some Galatians will lead to discord among the whole community. When this provoking occurred, people were diverted away from the ways of the spirit and resulting good works. Selfish acts of our sinful nature are contrary to the humility required of Christ's followers demonstrated by Christ. A life fulfilled, a life filled with God's spirit would show fruit and build unity um, among believers. So this passage really um, hit me personally because um, as you know, I'm young, so I always look for the right things in the wrong places. Um, but when I surrendered myself, when I surrendered my life to God, I was actually able to receive that love, peace, and joy that I was looking for in all the wrong places. So whatever you're looking for, you can find it within God not within your flesh. There's always gonna be a battle between your flesh and your spirit. But remember that whatever your flesh wants is gonna have sexual immorality. So follow what God wants. You know what God wants. And even though it may not be popular, especially for people in my age, it may not be popular, but it's what's right. And I'm more concerned about my soul than what other people think. Are there any questions? Or comments. I will say it's a, a great lesson, um, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, you know, when you started out, you started out saying that holy um, can also mean to be set apart or anointed, and that mm -hmm. we're called, you know, to live holy lives. Um, you know, and then to live in the spirit. And the question that always comes to my mind is how do we do that? And, and I like the way you contrasted the works of the flesh uh, compared to the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And I like how you 
distinguish the two. Uh, it's a very good lesson. I thank you uh, for it, and I have thoroughly enjoyed this lesson. God bless you. Bless you. Good morning. It was good morning. a very powerful lesson. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Is there another? Okay. Well, um, next week we are starting um, a new theme and unit. The theme will be partners in, the, in a new creation. The unit will be God delivers and restores. The lesson is entitled God foretells destruction. The devotional reading will be from Isaiah chapter 47 verses 10 through 15. And the background scripture is Isaiah chapter 47. Oh, he has it all up there. <laughs> and it will be taught by Michael Eccles Jr., Minister Michael Eccles Jr. And, and also... Oh, um, no, that's, that should be... Who was it? I think it's Roslyn Rosalind Walker. Oh, Roslyn yeah, Walker. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, I got ahead of myself. I apologize. Yeah, Michael's the second week. <laughs> second week. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. yeah, I'm trying to rush it along. So Roslyn Michael Walker. eyes got real big. Like, I'm teaching next week? <laughs> Rosalind Walker will be uh, teaching us. We thank you for speaking up, Sister Roz. And next week will also be the beginning of our summer quarter. So uh, keep that in mind as well. Awesome. Um, Pastor Thornton, do you mind closing us out in prayer? Sure. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come to you on this morning, on this day, Father God, first of all, we want to say thank you. We thank you for things being as well as they are. We thank you for love, grace, hope, and mercy, Father God. We thank you for this opportunity that we've had this morning to have a closer walk with you, Father God. We pray that your word will strengthen us, that we may stand in the midst of any hurt, harm, and danger that may come our way. We thank you, Father God, for this closer walk with you. We thank you for the message, and we thank you for the messenger. Father God, we ask all these things in the mighty and marvelous miraculous name of your son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. 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 Walk with the King and be all God has called you to be. Amen. 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 See y'all next week. Amen. God bless you.